peaceful warriors wellness feel better move better be better hi i'm lena roberts and today i'm here with sam bellier sam tell me a little bit about yourself uh, so actually how we met was you studied with me for reflexology and I am a massage therapist here in the Florida area and specialize in reflexology. I've been doing reflexology for about 12 years now and I teach and write and speak all over the world on the topic. And so we're here to, to talk about some, some techniques and some nitty gritty stuff that hopefully you will find as interesting as we do. I love reflexology. I have always loved reflectology, and the more, the deeper I get into it, the more I say, oh, this is why I'm doing this. Mm -hmm. I, um, I loved training under you. I learned so much about feet, but I also learned so much about myself. Mm -hmm. uh, I, um, what is that healer heal thyself? Yeah, for sure. And, um, and learned so much about myself in that, there are so many others out there just like me mm -hmm. that are having the exact same problems that I have. And you have taught me how to help myself and in turn help my clients. Mm -hmm. And, um, but you are so much different than the, um, the average reflexologist or reflexology teacher. Um, and I spoke this to, to one of, um, Alex who mm -hmm. trained with us. He, um, he has a um, hard time finding his voice. Mm -hmm. And I really said this to him was that you taught me how to use my voice. Mm -hmm. And it has not only helped me be a better reflexologist, but I am a better um, massage therapist. I am a better um, advocate for my community. Mm -hmm. And that came from finding my voice. Yeah. And, um, because you teach a lot more of foot reading. Mm -hmm. And the foot reading is, um, I'm gonna let you get a little bit more into explaining what the foot reading is. Cause to me, it's from my heart. Right. And so, so you can explain a little bit more to me. So as far as my style of reflexology goes and the way that, you know, I teach and run the program, I think that you finding your voices is really what is missing. Not just in not just in the reflexology world, but also in the bodywork world in general. Like we, as massage therapists, are so focused on the manual and so focused on doing the work that we forget that intelligent feedback with clients is such a valuable part of the practice. And reflexology is an assessment modality. We're using the extremities as the microcosm to show us what's happening in the body and the macrocosm with these clients. And I think that if practitioners can step up to the plate and use their voice and say, hey, I'm noticing in this area of the body, there's a significant amount of tension. Where do you think that's coming from? And having deeper discussions with clients and educating them about how they can take their wellness into their own hands, then we as practitioners start to bridge the gap between people feeling like they need to go all uh, kind of independent and WebMD themselves to death or, you know, spend 15 minutes with a physician who is trying to sort through so many different things at once that they don't have the time to dedicate to that, that particular patient. You know, we as body workers get to, to straddle those two worlds, funnel them to the practitioners that they need and also help them master their own self healing journey through self care. And the way that we do that is by providing feedback that we would find through the reflexes and using mode modalities like reflexology that are more geared towards assessment. Assessment. Um, what is it that you say in your um, videos? You do not diagnose DPT. Right. DPT. Wait, ACE. Yeah. ACE. Access, educate, no, assess, coach, and educate. Right. So we don't diagnose, prescribe, or treat. We don't DPT. Um, and that, like, when... When I got into reflexology, the whole premise of reflexology is press the button, fix the issue. And if you are feeling 
a particular area of tension, you know, a lot of clients will be, so, so what is that area? And we need to be very careful because if we say, oh, that's the heart, that might be considered diagnosing and we don't want to play doctor. That's not our job. Um, but instead we can provide feedback and say, Hey, this is part of the cardiovascular system. Um, how are you taking care of that area? Are you walking regularly? Do you have any history of cardiovascular issues in your family? Do we need to send you to a specialist to check up on that area? Do we need to get you into a, um, a more personal training program to help get physical health online in that body system. Um, and instead of saying, you know, this looks like a heart problem, that's not what we're trying to do. We're not trying to diagnose, prescribe, or treat. But instead, we are taking the softer side of that approach. And we are stepping up to the plate using our voice and we are assessing or noticing these patterns in the tissues. And we're able to recognize when something does not look right based on our experience as body workers. We are coaching. We are actually we are actually speaking with our clients about what actionable steps they can be doing outside of the session. Um, we are advocating, which is super huge for clients because a lot of clients, I, it's as simple as, have you, have you scheduled a follow-up or have you gone for a second opinion? You know, a lot of clients just need that supportive role that they don't necessarily get from these people that are on such regimented traditional healthcare budgets. Um, and then we educate, like it's our job to be up on our research, to direct clients towards additional reading and studies and to put them in touch with potential plants if we're qualified with that or different exercise programs if we're qualified with that and to even refer them to other mental health professionals if they feel like stress is part of the issue and getting them in touch with through education, the different avenues of wellness that are open to them and not feeling like they just need to do one particular thing. I, I like that because I always felt like as a massage therapist that I knew that these, you know, drink more water, eat better food, exercise more. And now I feel like that I can say, okay, these are the things that you need to do that are within my scope. I don't, mm -hmm. You know, but I can say you need to drink more water because down here in your feet, you're really tightening it up, you know, and you, you need more water to help cushion there. Right. And I have more of a voice to be able to say that with my clients. And, and it has, I, I was telling Alex was that I have, you know, always taken, I have you know, at least 500 hours every renewal every two years of continuing education mm -hmm. and I have learned a lot but it wasn't until I came to you that I learned how to apply that to my clients after care not when they're in here in my room for the hour or 90 minutes or whatever it's I feel like that I have an impact on them afterwards yeah and that was kind of part of our discussion before we started filming was the idea of you know when you initially train in a modality it, it can be just step one, you know, and with reflexology, I was trained in the Inga method, which was very much just, just work it out, just press the button as hard as you can, and then the body will, will heal itself. That is not how I view reflexology now, um, but it is how many reflexologists view the modality as press button fix issue. Um, if somebody has a stomach issue, you just hit the stomach reflex as hard as possible and it will work out that tension. Um, but instead, as we learn assessment and as we have a better vocabulary to speak to our clients and to speak with the body in general through reflexology, we are palpating and we're saying, hey, the stomach should have a really nice, spongy, slightly warm texture to it. If it is caved in and cold and tight, we know that this person may not have enough stomach acid. We know that this person's stomach young in holistic medicine or more of a traditional Chinese medicine perspective is depleted. How can we bring that back up to the surface? And do they need to schedule an appointment with a registered dietitian to work on those stomach issues as a source of what they maybe come in, came in for, which was headaches, you know, and that that part of the storytelling, that part of the discovery process, that part of reflexology, not just being a, mo a modality that is manual, but instead being this process of picking the client apart and using all of your health and wellness training, not just that you've taken from other people, but things that you've learned for yourself along the road as well. You know, if you feel like you're underqualified, just remember that you've had to keep yourself alive up until this point, And that brings a lot of expertise and you will attract the clients that you are uniquely qualified to help. 
help with. You know, so all of that in a reflex context really lets you be that that pivot point for a lot of clients to determine where they go next instead of just, well, see you next week. And and that's why I, 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 a lot of the reflexology classes that I had taken before were very um, single. Mm -hmm. You use your hands, you may use some tools, but it's always press button, fix issue. And with you, I gained my confidence to bring in the stones to bring in you know, all of my crystals and um, specifically the um, salt rocks that I use for and the everything. cupping and, everything. and the cupping. The cupping has been game changer on people with plantar fasciitis mm -hmm. because before we were talking about plantar fasciitis on our podcast, and the one thing that Sam said you need to really get to treat plantar fasciitis is circulation mm -hmm. and the cupping pulls the tissue in a different direction than what the body has ever felt before. And in that process of doing that, you um, you create space. And, you, and the space then is filled up with fluid, so you have created a, a really good pumping circulation there. Mm -hmm. And with people with plantar fasciitis, it is so tender. Yes. I need some WD-40 on that, huh? <laughs> um, it is so tender that downward pressure a lot of times yep. you can't do. Exactly. But I can crank it up really high on the mm -hmm. cups because it's pulling it in a different direction than pressing down, and they don't have that pain stimulus. Mm -hmm. And it has, um, and I, I have little bitty tiny cups. I'm going to step behind yeah, you. Yeah, go for it. I have little bitty tiny cups that I can use on mm -hmm. the feet. I have little bitty tiny cups that I can get in between, in between the their toes. toenail. I mean, the toes in there. It is amazing. I have um, much bigger cups that I use on, on the body. Other body. Mm -hmm. But I have these little bitty tiny cups that is just amazing mm -hmm. um, of the effect that you can get from suction. Right. And that's... You know, when we when we as massage therapists investigate a manual modality, it's so important to work with your body, be creative, understand different ways to do the same thing. Um, but then one of the things that really makes reflexology shine is identifying when manual therapy is not enough and how you as practitioner can then remind people like, hey, based on what we're seeing here, no amount of cupping, no amount of manual work, no amount of hydration is going to fix this particular style of, of symptomology. Instead, we need to look somewhere else in the body or in the mind or in the emotions or into um, the diet or into other aspects of health and wellness that are outside of the treatment room that you need to do on your own time instead of us trying to manually fix something that is not within our not just legal scope but also our our ability as healers you know it has to be putting that responsibility back on the client at certain points and reflexology is an excellent modality to draw that boundary a little bit cleaner i, I like that and a lot of people come in here and they're they want you to fix it for them and a lot of times yeah i can fix it for you for a little while mm -hmm. but it's going to come back right and unless you want to continue to come back here and spend a lot of money, um, and, and I'm okay with that too. <laughs> I mean, just be honest with you. I'm, I'm happy to do that. Mm -hmm. But a lot of times you need that at three o'clock on the Saturday morning, mm -hmm. and you need something that you can do for yourself. Right. And self care and being directed in a healthy manner right. as opposed to saying I can't help you when you're in the middle of the night mm -hmm. you're on your own there yeah. but I can say hey these are the things you can use a, a tennis ball mm -hmm. you can you know, get on the steps and do the stretches you can drink a glass of water and mm -hmm. you will be amazed at what effect that glass of water does on you mm -hmm. and so I I really like that reflexology is not just push button fix issue Definitely. I, I like to say that it has, it helps the body communicate with itself better. Yep, exactly. And that means you bringing everything that you know 
into knowing it and feeling it and doing it are three different things. <laughs> For sure. For sure. Yeah. Um, speak to me a little bit more about the zones. Yeah, so the way that reflexology maps the foot um, is we divide not just the feet, but also the hands, the face, the ears, um, and any of the extremities that we would use for reflexology into five different sections according to anatomical order. So the top of the foot being the toes represents zone one, which is the head. Then we move down into the ball of the foot, that area that you would push off of if you were running, um, that padded area, which is gonna be all chest, lung, shoulders. Then the arch is divided into upper digestive and lower digestive. And the heel itself represents everything sciatic or lower body. So all the legs, the muscles, the knees, etc. So the feet are in? The feet would be technically in zone five. Okay. Yeah, but this is also a really interesting question back to the, the um, plantar fasciitis, you know, the, and even if we were to look at carpal tunnel, um, the idea of the extremities as the whistleblowers of the body or the tip of the iceberg, like the extremities only get involved when you've neglected yourself to such a severe point that the tea kettle's already boiling on the stove. Like there's so much compounded stress underneath that, that the, the, the numbing or tingling or pain that you're experiencing in the extremities is just the tip of that, that larger health crisis that's finally coming to a boil. And the body's like, nope, this is no longer nego negotiable. We are, we are taking you out of commission. Um, and that often comes from that stabbing pain of plantar fasciitis, extremities going numb, or pain that you just can't tolerate anymore. I have, um, I have a client, and I don't know if we want to get into this right at this point, but I do want to put it out there so, so I won't forget before the end of the show. I have a client she's coming to me for plantar fasciitis. I have never worked with someone that has tarsal. Um, yep, tarsal outlet. Yes. Um, what is the the things that make them seem a lot similar, and what is the what are the differences in these? Yeah. So when we're looking at um, like. Thoracic outlet syndrome is what a lot of practitioners are probably familiar with in terms of just nerve impingement, right? Nerve impingement that does various things to the extremity that the nerves and vascularity have to go through in order to, to innervate that particular extremity. The same thing happens all over the body, including the feet. So if we were to look at thoracic outlet syndrome, if we were to look at carpal tunnel syndrome, if we were to look at tarsal tunnel syndrome, um, the idea is still the same. The bones maybe have shifted out of place. Uh, the ligaments are pulled tight. The muscles are pulled tighter. The vascularity is starting to flood and put excess pressure on the extremity itself, producing a wide range of symptoms as lymph backing up tends to do. Um, and <clears throat> the result is just this messy uh, kind of cross pointing of, you know, is it this? Is it that? It's, it's all of it together. Um, but, you know, just like we were talking about on the podcast, oftentimes in that instance, the remedy is going to be circulation. The remedy is going to be movement. The remedy is going to be proper strengthening, proper tone and proper lengthening of the, of the extremities, um, that happens through not just manual body work, but also active self care. Um, and people who have tension in the extremities to that degree with that extremity representing the rest of the body normally have issues elsewhere, like with tarsal issues and plantar fasciitis and many foot issues, the ankle will be completely locked. When the ankle is locked, the ankle in reflexology represents the pelvis as the central movement point of both the foot and the body. And so when we're kind of sitting at that 90 degree angle all day, every day, and the feet are in that same space, and you're not shaking that tension, loosening those muscles and getting that circulation, it becomes really difficult for the ankles to have proper range of motion, for the hips to have proper range of motion, and then the bones, the muscles, and the fluid circulation in between, it gets super angry. Um, and so depending on what you see, a lot of it is going to be, you know, does movement help it or does it make it worse? Um, do you find that pain is increased or decreased with eating? Um, do you find that uh, you are chronically dehydrated or is swelling part of the issue? And asking some simple questions really gets you to narrow down what what is wrong here. But a lot of clients will be like, yeah, you know, movement helps, but I don't really get a chance to go out as much. And I'm like, well, I can induce movement for you. But if you want this pain to stop coming back all the time, you're going to need to change your lifestyle. And that's a simple feedback mechanism that a lot of clients won't get unless the therapist feels confident enough to speak up. 
Right. And and it's hard hearing that you're going to have to change your life because of this pain. And um, uh, and we find this in any healthcare. It doesn't matter what yeah. modality or specialty it is. People don't want to change what they're doing. True. And it's not until things get so bad that they have to. And a lot of clients are chasing this idea of pain relief. Pain is the body's feedback mechanism, right? Like pain is there as the the guardrails to make sure that you don't do something that's super crazy. So if you're trying to take away pain, if your goal is just to get out of pain, your goal should be to get rid of why the pain occurred, not the pain itself. So a lot of people who are used to taking painkillers all the time or who are looking for surgical intervention understand that quality of life is super important and nobody should judge you for your pain. But at the same time, you know, just clipping a nerve or just deadening that sensation is not enough for chronic instability. No, it's not. It's I mean, there is a specific reason to do that nerve ablation, I think mm-hmm. it's what it's called. And, there, and usually that is something that has come out as an accident or something like that. Something has definitely shifted. Um, but there is a, a use for that, and, mm-hmm. and some people get great relief with it. But I can personally tell you of about 10 people that I know that have went and had the nerve ablation done, and it hasn't touched right. their problem. Yep. It's um, so, and, and these same people, if they would take that 15 minutes a couple of times a day and walk around the block or um, and drink a glass of water while they're doing that and eat properly and not out of the vending machines, they would see a huge difference in their life mm-hmm. and, and not in the quality of life, not just their pain, but everything else that goes along with that. I, I, see, I see that a lot with mm-hmm. my nurse friends. Yeah. A lot. They are the ones out there keeping you alive while they are eating a Snickers bar and a pack of nabs with a Coke in the break room. For sure. And and that will be all that they will have to eat or drink during that 12-hour shift if they are there. Yep. And, and I'm sure that it's getting even worse now with COVID. I am so thankful that I'm not in the hospital anymore. They, they are... But they're the ones that are walking on that hard concrete floor. They and they're doing a lot of movement, but they are also in those nurse shoes right. <laughs> that don't allow for a lot of movement. And here's the thing, like the body knows when you're moving therapeutically versus when you're moving for a job. The body absolutely knows if you're up and down stairs all day for your work, that is not exercise, that is obligation. And the body knows the difference. So I think that it's really important back to that idea of self-care. Like we need to recognize like, hey, yes, you may be checking the box, but are you fulfilling the requirement? Um, and that is very different and really also hard for people to, to know. I get a lot of clients who are in manual labor fields and they're like, I don't understand. I literally, I'm so active all day. I'm like, you may be active. Yeah, but you're not taking care of yourself. And there's a big difference there. Yes, I have. Um, I used to say that I used to walk around my unit. It was constant walking around my unit, and um, and I did. I and, but I was the one that was eating the crackers and the Snickers bars. And then whenever I became a massage therapist, I walk around this table now. And but I eat a lot better, and I feel so much better. I. I cannot, every single nurse, every single healthcare practitioner, I tell them the story of, about how I was chronically sick. I was chronically had some kind of sinus infection, ear infection, bladder infection, some kind of infection. I was always tired. And then whenever I slowed down and started listening to my body, whenever I was sleepy, I would go to sleep and not fight through it because I was strong. I feel so much better. Right. And it, it has um, taken how many years? I think I was in my mid-40s before that clicked with me. Mm-hmm. So repetition of telling our clients the same thing every single time is so important of when they're ready to hear it and do it, they will. For sure. So where are we at on time? 
Close to 25 minutes. Okay. Do you want to talk about the differences in charts? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Good, good. So um, one of the big questions that we had before we started the video was this idea of reflexology being a little bit more confusing because the charts look different depending on where you go. Um, and we talked a little bit about zones beforehand, but it is important to understand that reflexology, just like other forms of manual therapy, are also a business. And when you look at reflexology online, if you Google reflexology charts, um, the charts will have discrepancies. They will be visually different. And there are two major reasons for that. One is that uh, the school might have different points that they've learned over time are good for particular conditions. Um, as an example, the Inga method that I trained in puts the eye and the ear reflexes on what we would call the horizontal um the, uh, the shoulder line guideline, which we talked about in Sally Kay's work, is subclavian, the subclavian reflex, which drains a lot of the inner ear and eye. Uh, so it is correct just for different reasons. So there are variations in terms of the school's theories about why reflexology works and the key points to emphasize. But then number two is that the maps have to be different due to copyright reasons. If a map is too similar to another map that's already been created, then that's a legal issue. So maps need to be changed, the colors need to be altered, the shapes need to be altered in order to satisfy copyright requirements. So if you are looking at a reflexology map, the suggestion that I have for you is to remember that reflexology is based on anatomical order. Head at the top, lower body at the bottom, and all of the organs fall as they would in between. The only problem is when you're starting to get like the heart reflex in the heel. You know, that's when you start to know that this person didn't really know what they were doing. Uh, like I taught a workshop a couple weeks ago over in Dunedin, uh, which went really well. And it, uh, somebody had brought one of the maps that they had gotten from an essential oil catalog as like a freebie. And it was hilarious to me as we looked at that map together as a class and I showed, I was like, do you see how the gallbladder reflex is on both feet, but the gallbladder is only on one side of your body? That lets you know that this person did not necessarily have reflexology training. Do you see how the large intestine isn't divided into ascending, transverse, and descending colon? Um, that is one thing that reflexology practitioners are very acute with in terms of how they make their maps. Um, certain maps will list the breast tissue on it, some won't. Some will add the lymphatic reflexes, some won't. There will be little changes like that, but most of it will be following anatomical order because we're looking at that microcosm, macrocosm model as an exact replica of human anatomy. I have several different um, feet reflexology charts in here and I use them all mm -hmm. because if I have someone that literally comes in here and they are much more um, emotional I'm going to go to your chart mm -hmm. if I get someone that comes in here a little bit more analytical and um, I call it dictatorship <laughs> they come in here and they say I want this and this and this area is worked and don't touch anything else and, and then I want to go to um, Karen Ball. Karen's chart. Yep. Yeah, Karen has um, a lot more. And that's more Karen's personality, right. too. Exactly. And you know, so I really get more. Um, and then anyone that comes in here with any kind of um, lymphatic um, weight problem, anything with the fluid, I'm going to do a lot more of the salad case stuff. Uh -huh. And it, it really helps me. And I have charts, other charts all over this office. Um, but these are the three that I really use personally the most. Mm -hmm. And I have, um, we have an Ingram in there that Catherine absolutely loves. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's because it's big. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but she, she I, and I also think that that's what she was first exposed to. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that, that's her go-to method. Um but it's been a a a pure pleasure learning about all the different types of reflexology. Mm -hmm. I have, um, and to know that there are this many out there that even if I don't agree with their methods or whatever, that's not saying that there are not people out there that benefit right. 
greatly from them. It's the same thing with all forms of body work. Like I don't, I don't agree with practitioners who rip apart a client with large amounts of pain. Some clients go for that specifically. Um, and there is a practitioner for everybody and there's a style of reflexology for everybody. One is not better than the others, but they are just different ways of achieving the same result. And, and that's what I really like about this office that we have created here in that um, I'm not going to do any painful. If, if I feel you flinching, I'm going to back off because I am a Southern girl and I get so much further being softer and sweeter than I do if I just try to jump on you. And the research actually supports that. So a lot of clients will come in and they'll they'll be expecting this bloodbath of a session, you know, because there are several popular YouTube videos of people just getting killed by reflexologists, mm -hmm. often using tools. Tools are the devil, yes. um, in my opinion. Um, but again, other practitioners use tools, totally their practice. But for me, you know, what the research is sharing is that if we trigger that pain response, the body's going to shut down the session. The body, especially because we're dealing with nerves and reflexology, if the body feels like you are a threat, it's not going to soak in that work as much. Um, and the lighter work that Sally does with the lymphatic system is getting major results, and she doesn't use large amounts of pressure. Mm -hmm. Same thing with Barbara Scott and Carol Samuels, and all of the published reflexologists are not using this bone-crushing pressure that a lot of traditional reflexologists are using. So I think that that shift is making reflexology more accessible and a little bit more amicable to those who have yes. different pressure requirements. I, uh, Alex um, Howe, who is a reflexologist here, he um, has a much deeper pressure. That, that's him. That's his mm -hmm. hands. They are much more deeper. And so whenever I get someone and they're asking for this deeper pressure, because a lot of people, I feel like they... They feel like they have to have felt something for it to be doing anything. And and I love to be able to say, I think your next session should be with Alex. I think that you would really like his pressure. And um, and, and just like with any of the massage therapists here, I'm like, okay, you, um, you really want to have the massage also. We have the availability of you being able to have the massage, have that area that, have you, that you were hurting mm -hmm. actually worked on but then let's work on it through your feet or your hands or your face or your ears or any of those combination of mm -hmm. is it going oh yeah it's been going this whole oh, time all right. <laughs> sorry, sorry. <laughs> thank you very much for joining me today sam i have so enjoyed talking with you as of every time that i get to talk with you please tell everyone how they can get in touch with you if they have more questions about specific reflexology or herbalism or whatever you are doing right then. Yeah, and likewise, thank you for having me. Um, so best way to contact me is just through my website, which is sambellier.com. Uh, you can also find me on all major social media channels with my first and last name as well. Uh, and we can connect through any of those platforms. Thank you very much. And you can also find us here at peacefulwarriorswellness.com and all the social media um outlets out there we're on it's pw wellness and uh you can find us here in downtown st petersburg thank you for joining us bye peaceful warriors wellness feel better move better be better when you feel better you feel more like you and when you move better there's so much you can do be who you were meant to be Oh